Hey, Bridgetown Church, and to all of you listening online, welcome to the Bridgetown Daily for Friday, March 12th. John Mark Comer here in Portland, Oregon. Um, A few things. One, this coming Sunday, we are regathering as a church in person, or I should say starting to regather kind of one inch at a time. Sign up on our website. You do have to register in order to come because we can only fit so many people in with social distancing and all of that. And also just a reminder, Sunday is daylight savings time. For any of my fellow Luddites who don't sleep next to their phone as an alarm, but I have an old school alarm clock that I actually have to, with my digits, with my fingers, I have to set the time on this coming Saturday night. Secondly, you know, we said many months ago that our intention was to run the daily from January 1st, when we kind of restarted it after last summer, to when we regather. So I am sad to say today, this Friday, is our last daily, at least for this season of time. And I know that this has been a gift to a lot of you, just a few minutes with a few words and space to come home to God and let God come home to you. And it has been our honor as a pastoral team and our many guests to serve you in that way. Thank you for listening. Third, um, today is Friday as well, which means it is the lead up to the Sabbath. The kind of ancient Sabbath is sundown on Friday night to sundown on Saturday. The Christian Sabbath is often all day on Sunday. Either way, whether you are a few hours away or 24 hours away or whatever, we're in that pre-Sabbath rush, what the New Testament writers call the preparation day, meaning the day before the Sabbath, where you do all of your prep. In the Comer house, I have Friday, Saturday off. So Friday's kind of day off, and we run errands, and we clean the house, and we grocery shop, and I go for a long run, and we answer phone calls and emails and all of that, get ready to power off all of our devices for a full 24 hours, and it's kind of this frenetic afternoon, which is all a lead up to Sabbath dinner when the sun goes down and we sit around the table and we take a few deep breaths and we light the candles of Sabbath and we pour a bottle of wine and we break bread, uh, which my lovely wife will make fresh sourdough bread every single week. What a gift. And then with our family and with close friends, we have an open table on Sabbath where there's a number of us who just come together, break bread, rest, laugh, give thanks, celebrate, sleep, (laughs) and just relax together into God's goodness. And so I just want to give you a very short Sabbath meditation as we move forward to the Sabbath, whether, again, whether for you that's tonight or Saturday night or Sunday or another day in the week. Genesis 2, of course, the prototype passage in all of the library of Scripture on Sabbath. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and he made it holy because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Have you ever had a long work day or work week and you get done, and maybe it's manual labor. Maybe uh, you do manual labor for your work, or maybe you own a home and there was a, a long weekend where you put in a new lawn or you built a deck or whatever it is. We've done a couple of remodel projects. But think of that feeling where your body itself uh, is tired and you feel an ache or a pain and you're ready to just sleep, but you finish the work. The deck is built off the back of your house or you finish framing that house if you work in construction or whatever it is, and you sit down, and in my mind, it's just a summer day in my mind. Maybe that's just in faith because we're still in winter here in Portland, but you sit down outside, you take a deep breath, and there's just that great feeling of, I finished the work, and it's beautiful. That's kind of the imagery in Genesis chapter 2. 
after six, quote, days of God's creation of the heavens and the earth, meaning just everything in the cosmos. That's God's kind of pull up a chair, sit down, smile, breathe, give thanks, and say, man, this is really, in his own language, very good. But there's a deeper theological meaning here that God's work of the creation of all that is, it was done, and now we live in his finished work, an idea that's picked up by the writer of Hebrews and other New Testament theologians about kind of the overtones between Genesis and finished work and Sabbath and Jesus and his finished work on the cross. As he said, it is finished, and now we live in a kind of emotional and spiritual rest on the other side of Jesus, not earning anything from God, but just living under the compassion and love of God and participation in the inner life of God himself. But there's also a practical level to the Sabbath. For six days of the week, our focus in a healthy, you know, in the Sabbath command and the Ten Commandments is actually a dual command. For six days you shall work, but the seventh is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. So it's a dual command of both work and rest. Both are crucial to our human flourishing. And for six days, we work. And our focus in a healthy way is on the present, but really with an eye to the future, to all of the work that is yet to be done. So I don't know about you, but I start each work day, even my day off, where it's just kind of work I don't get paid for, with a to-do list. All right, here's the three things I need to get done today, or the 33 things I need to get done today. But the Sabbath is not like that. On the Sabbath, our focus is on the past on what we have done over the last week, good and bad, and above all, on what God has done over the last week and down through redemptive history, in particular through his coming in Jesus, his dying, his rising, his ascension to the right hand of the Father, the coming of the Holy Spirit, the ushering in of the kingdom of God that we all have access to now, and so much more. We focus on what God has done in the past and We live in the present more than ever because we have the space to breathe a little. We stop fighting against time. A lot of us just have this negative relationship with time where there's always too much to do, not enough time to do it. The word for that, by the way, is hurry. We are in a hurry. And so we feel like time is our enemy. The clock is against us. And we're racing against time, as we would say. And we're fighting against time in this competitive kind of zero-sum game. But on the Sabbath, we call in our mystus. It's like that beautiful story from World War I of Christmas Day when both sides said, let's just stop fighting and sing together and party together and play soccer together. It's like we call in our mystus and we make peace with what is. One of the great goals of Christian spirituality, or if you prefer, discipleship to Jesus, is just learning, like Jesus, to be present to the now, right? In our mind, to be really present to our body, to our breathing, to what's happening in front of us, around us, what the Spirit of God is stirring and up to and the people right in front of us, to the people in front of us, whereas so often our human mind is in the past or in the future. It's everywhere but right here and right now. And part of that is not just being or learning to be present to the now, but learning to be present to what is, to reality, M. Scott Peck defined mental health as dedication to reality at all costs. I think you could at some level define Christian spirituality the same way. Dedication to reality at all costs. The reality of God. The reality of eternity. The reality of our mortality and how fleeting our life is, how vulnerable and contingent. I just did a funeral a few days ago for a 23-year-old first-time father out of the blue car accident. Tragedy, an invitation to face reality. All of us are mortal. We live and we die. To face the reality of sin in our body and all around us in our society, to face the reality of joy and the goodness of God, uh, to say with the psalmist, my cup overflows, like the, the signs, the evidence of God's generosity and creativity and love and provision in my life are all around me. Like the psalmist, I have all I need. And this is so important because the now and reality, that's where God is. 
That's why we want to be there. That's where the Spirit of God is moving. That's where the pain is, which is why we often don't want to be there. But it's also where the joy is. And if we self-medicate and distract ourselves with a past orientation or too much of a future orientation, yes, we numb the pain, but we also miss out on the joy. For most of us, to live this way, like Jesus, present to the moment, present to the pain and the joy of the moment, ready to just give thanks and spontaneous eruption of joy and gratitude, or to weep as Jesus would do so, based on what the moment is. For us, this means, for most of us, learning to slow way down. This morning, in prayer, a line came to mind from the spiritual writer Evelyn Underhill, who once said, The spirit of joy and the spirit of hurry cannot live under the same roof. The spirit of joy, and she capitalized spirit there, as in the spirit of God, and the lowercase s, spirit of hurry, they can't live under the same roof. They can't live in the same body. They can't live in the same soul. And this, again, is the gift of Sabbath. The Sabbath, in a sense, and this is really how all of the practices or the spiritual disciplines function, kind of, it's like a training, it's like training wheels, if you can remember your childhood. It's like what training wheels are to riding a bicycle. Or if you're a runner, it's what kind of warm-up drills where you work on your posture and your form and how your feet fall on the pavement. It's what that is to running. It's, it's a way or it's what scales are or warm-up scales before you play live guitar in your band. It's a way to reach, to train, or, or in our case, to retrain our mind and our body itself to move at the speed of Jesus and in the way of Jesus. What Kosuke Koyama, that Japanese theologian, called the speed of love which he was very clear, is a slow speed, an unhurried speed. So whenever you Sabbath, whether it's tonight or tomorrow or Sunday or another day, or if you don't even Sabbath, and I would invite you to, by the way, if you take nothing else from not just this episode, but from the daily over the last year, however many months it ran through COVID, our aim has really just been very simple to serve you well, in particular, to help ground you in the peace and presence of God, in the now, in your body, in your breath, in the reality of what is, to live at peace with all of the above, with what is, and more than just peace, even with joy and an eye open to the sun ready to break through the clouds. So, may you, this Sabbath, and as we emerge from a post-COVID world, or or at least to a less COVID world in the spring and summer and fall, a world with more traffic and long lines and urban noise and People ready to overschedule your entire life with commitment after commitment after commitment and a life of speed. May you, may I, may we as a church, may all of you listening, come back, yes, but not to normal, to a new normal. May we come back different, slower, simpler, more in our body, humble, grateful for what we have, full of wonder at the miracle of life, deeply embedded in relationships of community and life, and above all, dedicated to abiding in God, dedicated to a life of prayer, dedicated to slowing down and living with God, practicing the presence of God in the moment, and experiencing the filling of love and joy and peace from the Holy Spirit. Peace be with you all.